hiding place our hope our hope is safe within your name and this we know and this we know you promise never to forsake you never will what you began you will sustain and this we know
shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain just give him a praise cause he's brought us out God you brought us out of all our struggles God we thank you Jesus, 
Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. stay a captive you couldn't stand to see my chains and so you came to be my rescue to part the waters in my way Jesus you are my From death to life, from dark to night, in Jesus, you showed me what freedom is, and you call my name, you broke my shame, you are my deliverance. arms became my rescue your blood has told me what I'm worth and Jesus you are my deliverance from death to life from dark to night oh Jesus you show me Jesus you show me Freedom is, and you call my name, and you broke my shame. Love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated. 
ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. Your love defeated. Let me hear you sing that. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. this morning we're thankful that you delivered us father forgive us if we've 
experience the deliverance, the freedom, the forgiveness, and yet we come into a house like this and we struggle at moments to remember what it was like to be bound and broken and chained. And so we go through our motions and we call it good. But this morning, our hearts are reminded that we have been delivered, that we have been set free. We're not like we used to be. There's not only victory ahead of us, there's victory behind us because you've overcome. You've overcome. And so, Father, this morning we come against looking over our shoulder in fear, in, in fear of, of what we were, what someone may find out that we did. We are not bound by that chain because all things are new. We are a new creation. And the moment that you delivered us and set us free, it's like we started all over. And so our hearts are filled with praise and adoration. We're grateful. Our hearts are filled with gratitude because we deserved punishment. The sentence that we would have received would have been life and there would have been no parole. We would have been chained and bound from that day forward, but you walked in to our jail cell and you broke off our chains and you opened the cell door and you said you're free. And we celebrate our freedom this morning, Father. We don't take it for granted. We are thankful for the freedom that you have given us this morning. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so, Father, we thank you for our freedom this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. And, Father, at the same time, inside of us, there's this, this struggle because we recognize that many are even around us this morning, perhaps even in this room, certainly in our neighborhoods, in our communities, there are so many that are still living bound and broken. And our heart is moved because we want them to experience what we've experienced and find the life and move from darkness to light and death to life. That's our cry this morning. So, Father, we bring our movers to you. Ten individuals that we've each written down that we know that they don't know your son. They have not experienced the deliverance that Jesus brings. And so they live with shame and they live in bondage and they live in fear and they're not satisfied. And so this morning, we bring these 10 individuals to you and we ask you to save them, rescue them, bring them into light and life. And Father, I pray that you would position us, position us. We may be the only representative of your son's love that they will ever experience firsthand. Position us with a contagious smile and a contagious attitude and words of life, words of freedom. Help us to lead them into your kingdom for your name's sake. Father, we bring every need represented here today. Because the truth is, just because we've been delivered doesn't mean we don't have bad days. So, Father, I bring every need represented here in your people. There are folks in this room this morning, God, that are battling, even though they're safe, they're battling loneliness and heartache and depression, sickness and lack. And so this morning, Father, I just pray you'd walk into this room and remind us that once you set us free, we are free indeed. And you don't want us to walk back into any type of bondage. And so I pray that you would step in right now and meet the needs of our life and our hearts so that we can worship you with abandon and say that you're good. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you say, Steve, I don't know Jesus. I haven't made him the Lord, the Savior of my life. We want to give you that opportunity this morning. We will not embarrass you, I promise. What we will do is we will pray intelligently and put materials in your hand to help you on this journey. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand and pull it right back down and say, that's me. I need to make uh, 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 this transition from life, from death to life and darkness to light. I want to make Jesus the king of my heart and my life this morning. If that's you, real quick, will you just pull it up and wait just a moment on you. Father, search our hearts this morning. Know our spiritual condition. If we're far from you, I pray that you would woo us into relationship this morning. But I also pray this, 
if we've been closer to you than we are right now. I pray that you would draw us back into tight-knit, close fellowship and relationship with you. We give you praise for what you're going to accomplish and what you've already accomplished this morning. We come into this house with a spirit of expectation, recognizing that the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. So we, we come with bated breath, knowing that you can do in just a moment what could not take place in years through any other means or channels. We believe in you today. We ask you to have your way. And everybody said, amen. Come on, turn and give somebody a hug and let them know that you're so glad that they're here at Passion. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Say good morning. Love on them and fellowship just a moment. Welcome to Passion this morning. We're so glad to see you. Uh, I know it's summer, but uh, it's still glad to see, we're still glad to see you, even in summer, right? I'm, I'm especially glad to see you in summer, because uh, I know you could choose to be elsewhere, but we're delighted that you're here with us this morning, and we're anticipating God doing some great things. Uh, each June, uh, we do a series uh, called Voices. We've been, I look back, we've been doing this, I think now, in some version or form since about 2008, uh, somewhere in that, and uh, I say it like this every year, and some of y'all look at me funny, but it's the truth. Um, you should hear the best preaching you're going to hear all year during the month of June, um, because I believe that uh, God has positioned me in this house as a voice, but listen, one voice is not enough. Uh, you need to hear other voices, because if you only hear one voice, it becomes like Charlie Brown school teacher, right? And so I beat up on y'all all year long, and then I, then I get hired guns to come and beat up on you more. And, uh, but, but because we hear it from someone else, it, it resonates sometimes. And so we don't take this series lightly. I don't give up this pulpit uh, flippantly, and I honestly pray and ask God who he wants for us to invite each year. And it's been intriguing to me that each year God positions the right people with the right word. And I don't think this year will be any different than that. This morning, I am delighted uh, to have the opportunity to welcome our guest. Um, I guess I have known him all my life. I, I, my earliest uh, remembrance of our speaker this morning was in the 80s, but that's only because when you're young, you don't always take notice of what's going on around you. But his family's been involved with our family since, uh, I guess, when he was a teenager. So that's been a little bit ago. Uh, it's been a minute, right? Okay, so back in West Oklahoma, but our speaker today is Gary Bird. Gary Bird uh, is from, uh, or he's from West Oklahoma, I guess, originally, but went to Amarillo, Texas, and took over a church, uh, how long ago, 40 years ago? Moved there 45 years ago, took over a church. Uh, that church is still in existence today. It is one of the most outreach-oriented churches I've ever experienced. They feed every day of the week the, the, the hungry, they, they do prison, I mean, I don't even have time, it, it, they, they do so much, and out of that, um, uh, Pastor Gary, uh, who now has, and I'll tell you about what he's doing now here in a second, moved to Arlington, Texas, I'll tell you why in just a moment, uh, out of that got involved in uh, motorcycles, and uh, so now he is over M25, uh, Mission 25 initiative, and they do um, run for the wall and diaper run and all these different ministries basically to uh, connect with uh, the veterans of our country that have been forgotten and they do an incredible ministry there and the biker clubs and groups all across America and they're doing a phenomenal job um, but he just recently moved to Arlington Texas now this will show you what kind of guy he is they moved to Arlington Texas and moved into an apartment for the sole purpose of trying to evangelize that apartment complex. So this is not like put me in a retirement community 
and build me a big house. In fact, they sold their big house and moved into a little bitty apartment for the sole purpose of winning people to Jesus. This, that is the heartbeat. It won't take you long to figure out that's Pastor Jerry's heartbeat. Um, we kind of connect. Uh, I won't even tell you how all that happened, but we kind of connect because he's kind of blunt. Um, and I don't know if y'all figured this out, but there's some, somebody else that holds this microphone occasionally that kind of likes bluntness. And so I am delighted this morning. He's going to tell you a little bit about M25. I'll tell you about some materials it has, but then he's going to go into God's word. But it is my delight and honor this morning to introduce to you a good friend, Pastor Gary Bird, as he comes to deliver the word. Would you give him a passion welcome? Thank you. Thank you. So good to be here. I just need to know something. Is this being put on Facebook Live? Okay. I have to watch my stories if I'm Facebook Live because, uh, well, there's people that can misinterpret that. Uh, you know, what you say in here can be misinterpreted out there. And so I have to kind of watch how I do that. It's good to be with y'all. Um, the Elys have always been a special group, our family in our life. Uh, Carolyn and I, uh, I regret she's not with me this morning. But uh, she and I have celebrated. I hugged her last night and said, thank you for 50 June the 1st together. We've been together 50 years. And uh, I took her to Mount Scott. And if she would have said no, I was going to jump off the top of it. But she said yes. And we went to Bob and Evis as quick as we could and told them. Uh, they were the very first people that uh, we told. Bob is one of the heroes of faith uh, in my life. I really appreciate it. I've prayed for Steve every day since his heart attack. I guess probably there may have been uh, a dozen in all of those days that I haven't. But uh, this family means a lot to me, and I'm very honored to be here. I'm going to try it, and, and it's great to have my our EVUSA secretary here. When I said my, she keeps me out of trouble with Brenda Phillips. So, I mean, I make a lot of lot of uh, mistakes in this world, and I don't color in too many lines. I took my leadership staff one time to a Bill Wilson conference, and it was on how to color outside the lines. And we had a, you know, a debriefing after we got back with our team, and they said. I said, what did you get? And one of them raised their hand, Danny, and said, I didn't even know there was a box following you. And so, you know, when you color outside the lines, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to fit in the circles. So there's something that I want to share with you. Because, see, when I was a kid, um, I received the call to preach. I started preaching when I was 15. And then 67, almost 68. And when I started preaching... I didn't have people that set me down and taught me. I had people that led me to the cross. That man sitting back there never did set me down and say, this is what you do. He said, this is who you go to. And that was the way my life was rolled out. How to follow the voice of God. And when Pastor Steve given me this beautiful opportunity to come and share I haven't been in church in a while because I'm out in the fields and, and to get to come and worship and, and to be here with y'all is a real privilege. And when he did that and he said it's voices, I says, God, I don't want them to hear my voice. I want to hear your voice. But help me, Lord, to show them maybe a different way of hearing your voice. Because, see, I remember back, I took over a senior pastor in 1986 of a church that had been completely rebuilt because we'd been burned down by arson. We're on the bad side of town. Um, and so I would go to the Lord and I would stay on my face before the Lord every morning at 5 o'clock because all of my forefathers taught me to go to the Lord. And so I'd go at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd lay on my face before the Lord and I would say, God, and I would repeat this scripture and they're going to throw it up real quick. It's Jeremiah 33, 3. And it's, you know, if you call unto me, he will show you the secret things, the hidden things. I'm not going to read it for you. You can read it, but I'd really prefer you listen to me. You can read it when you get home. Um, but Jeremiah 33, 3 says, if you call unto me, 
And what, what I wanted God to do was teach me, show me how to lead my church that I was all of a sudden responsible for, all 35 of them. <laughs> I was going, God, help me figure out how to lead this group of people where you want us to go. And I worked so hard. Man, my church got up to about, I think the last number I remember was 776 members. And man, we, why couldn't have we had 777 and been complete, you know? And so, I, you know, 776. And, and, and I remember all of this stuff. And I had this beautiful staff of people. And everything was just going so good. And on the inside, I had felt like God had led me to this place to fight this battle inside this church, to build the kingdom through the church. And, and yet I saw that there was something else missing. And, and, and God, in the late 90s, began to stir in me about 20 years ago. And I began to say, God, let me hear your voice. Now, what I'm going to do is I want to show you a real quick video clip because I want you to see what we do. That's where this voice led me before I tell you how I got that voice or what the Lord spoke to me through this thing. So, guys, can y'all do that? Play this video and leave my microphone hot and keep the music down just a little bit because I want to talk, talk them through it as we go. I want you to see some of the things. This is what we do out of that church. We used to write. We feed seven days a week. Y'all know we've got to do something to change that. Okay, we're the answer. That's something that would came out of the voice that we heard from God. Number one, he talked about the veterans. We just rode from California to Washington, D.C., honoring the veterans of our country and remind, making our nation remember the POWs, MIAs of all wars. We go to the Native Americans. We do a thing called the War Horse. We're going to give two horses away in August at powwows. Uh, there's just so much I could tell you about this stuff. My wife just came back from Africa. She did a free camp over there. 287 children. She did a water well. Uh, it was a supernatural thing. We do Jews. We ride across the United States with Jews uh, in a different type of thing than normal. Um, we went to Israel and rode from actually London to Israel with Jews, standing with them. We're going back to Israel in December. we got a couple of things out there if you'd be interested. We do March for Life, and this is where Pastor Steve comes in. We, we, how many of y'all believe we've got to be pro-life? Now, guys, if y'all don't go with me here, we're going to have problems. How many of y'all believe we are to be pro-life? Yeah. And so we do a diaper run. Pastor Steve designed our patch up there, and uh, we raised 350,000 diapers and baby wipes for kids, 15,000 cash. We teach nights. I'm leaving here uh, Tuesday. I'll ride to Montana on my motorcycle and teach men to be men. Uh, how many of you believe men need to rise up again and be men? Okay. And so we, we got activated. M25 got activated when we did the, uh, the hurricanes. Uh, we also do TV. We've done um, over 230-minute TV programs. Uh, you can catch them on the Internet. We are doing the house plant down in Arlington, which is something different for us. Uh, boy, when you move to a big old town like Arlington, you don't know a soul. Uh, we do a summit, and any of y'all would like to come out this September the 27th through 28th, Bishop Beecham is going to be our guest. We end with Biker Sunday. About 3,000 bikers will show up. Um, we, uh, these are just some advancements that we did. We rode from, like I said, London to Israel, Jerusalem with Jews. And uh, what an incredible opportunity that was. Six weeks on a motorcycle with Jews. Um, we, uh, uh, these are the things that we do on a weekly basis. Is there any way I, th that I can see more of them? 
Can y'all turn the light up a little bit? I'm a communicator, not a, or a, you know, that other guy. I got to see your face. You know, you're not as bad as I thought you were. <laughs> Pretty dang good. All right, anyhow, what happened was, was in the midst of all of this, I had this uh, youth, pa- or this, what they called uh, armor bearer, and he would bring on Sunday morning. And they wouldn't let me see anybody. I couldn't shake anybody's hands because they didn't want to mess up God's anointing that morning. And uh, it's kind of crazy. That was the current fad of that day. And so that's what I was doing. And then all of a sudden, God started dealing with me about we're losing this country. And there's God. We've got to advance the kingdom. And and I, then I said, God, I want. I, th- I really don't want to be like Bob Ely. And I really don't want to be like Bishop Leggett. And I really don't want to be like the Apostle Paul. I want to be like you. How many of you believe we are to be like Jesus? Huh? How many of you believe we are to be like Jesus? And so I said, okay, God, and, and I want to hear you speak to me about being like you. And so what I've done is I how many of you all know reading the Bible will mess you up? Huh? And so I decided that I'd start reading the Bible all over again. And I started in Matthew 1. And I learned that God speaks to us. His voice should come from the Word of God first and foremost. How many of you believe that? And so I'm reading the New Testament. How many of y'all ever decided you was going to read the New Testament through? Huh? And you had to start at Matthew 1. Huh? Come on, help me. How many of you ever read Matthew 1? Or any of you are professionals at Matthew 1? Yeah, and you know, I'm going to tell you, I, I was going to get this one down, and I started, how many of you know it's Leroy begat Henry, and Henry begat Joe, and Joe begat Steve, and Steve begat Bob? How many of y'all know that's what it says? Well, I can't say those other names, so I was making up names, and I read it along, and, and I got through it, and the Holy Spirit says, you didn't get it, Gary, go back through it, and I said, okay, so I read it again. And I got, I just made bigger names. Instead of Joe, I would use Joseph. Instead of Steve, I'd say Stephen. And I'd use all of these bigger names, you know. Instead of Danny, I'd say Daniel, you know. And I had just stretched it out because I really get through this thing, man. And I got through it again. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he says, you didn't get it. Read it again. How many of y'all know I'm a slow learner? Look at me and say, that dude is a slow learner. All right, and so I read it again. And I think it was the fourth trip through it, all of a sudden, something started jumping off the pages at me. And I started seeing something I'd never seen in the Pentecostal Holiness Church. I started seeing women in there. There's only four listed other than the Mary. And I was start reading them, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm seeing the first woman is Tamar. She committed incest. <laughs> we don't even let them in our doors. You know, we're, we're cautious when he said, well, ago, it doesn't matter your past. How many of you know that's true in Jesus, but not so true in the church world? Yeah. Come on, am I telling the truth? Yeah. And I'm reading along, and I'm going, yeah, man, here's a woman that committed incest, and the baby is in the lineage of Jesus. <laughs> Whoa, man, I'm, I'm, I'm getting messed up. And then the next woman is Rahab, and she was a prostitute, a lying prostitute. And I'm going, Lord. <laughs> this is your lineage, you know, and I get down to the third woman, and uh, it's uh, Ruth, and I, I read that one, and I go, wow, Ruth, she's a godly woman, then I look at it, she's a Moabite, she's an enemy to the church, and I remember I had a praise and worship leader, and she was uh, giving me all kinds of fits, and uh, she was what I considered to be an enemy of the church where I was going, and so I prayed her out. Julie, I prayed that woman out of my church. And seven just like her came. And I said, God, I'll never do that again. (laughs) And I I realized that an enemy was in the lineage of Jesus. And then, of course, Bathsheba. And so my, my whole DNA of Christianity started changing. And then I get down to Matthew, the ninth chapter, and I saw... How many of y'all want to be like Jesus? He was criticized by the church because he sat with drunks. He said, Matthew the ninth chapter said that he sat in the New Living Translation, he sat with the scum. And all of my friends spoke in tongues. And I was going, oh God, how can I say I'm like you 
if I don't hang around people that you hung around. And so I started going to the bars. People said, what did people think when they saw your motorcycle? Because my motorcycle stood out, and it's not the one I'm riding today. But it, it stood out. It's, it's a, a witness bike. And we'd pull it in front of the bar. And I'd sit there, and, and uh, we, we didn't preach. Uh, we didn't sing. We didn't hand out tracts. We went in there and hung out with people like Jesus did. And we listened to them. i got to tell you one bar story. Can I do that? I don't know I, I, this time thing. Can I just roll? Okay. I just want to roll this more. I believe the Lord has a word because we got to change this country. Amen? And there's so much power in this church that there is the power to change. We've got to activate. Amen? But we got to see it from his eyes. We, Carolyn and I went in a bar one night, and uh, we sat down and, and um, had a hamburger and french fries and had a nice Coke. I want to tell you, Biker Bars make some of the best hamburgers in the country. And, and I went in, I had this big old juicy, greasy hamburger and fries, and Carolyn and I are sitting there, and we're talking. And I look at her, and I said, honey, maybe I went too far. Maybe I've gone too far. Maybe, maybe. Maybe the church is right. We shouldn't be in here. And she looked across the table with those loving eyes. And she said, shut up. <laughs> she said, enjoy the moment. And I said, okay. She said, we're doing what Jesus would have done. She reminded me of my sermons. I hate that sermon. She reminded me of my sermons. And so we just sat there. And the next thing I know, Steve, we, we've been married a while now. But we still are madly in love. And I reached across the table and grabbed her hand. And she's grabbing mine. And Esther, we're making eyes at each other. And you and Danny still do that, you know? Yeah. We're making eyes at each other. And we're having this great time with each other. I got up. I said, well, it's time to go home. She said, okay. So we got up and we left. And I paid my tip and then left a big deal. And I thought. Well, that didn't do a whole lot of good. So then next, uh, one of my elders called me, and he said, Hey, Gary, I heard you went to the bar last night. <laughs> How many elders call you and ask you? <laughs> Elder called me, and he says, Hey, Gary, I heard you went to the bar last night. Can I go with you tonight? I said, Sure, we'll go back. So we jumped on the bikes, and we met. We ended up at the same bar. And we walked in, and my wife sat down here, and I'm here. He's there, and she's over there. And I'm looking, and Sister Edith, there's a set of hands coming down around my wife's throat. How many of you know in a biker bar, that's a little nerve-wracking? And I'm watching these hands come down around my wife's throat, and they press against her, and they pull her in close. And this lady reached over and says, Ma'am, I don't know who you and your husband are, but we know you don't belong in here. But last night, you took time and you sat right over there at that table. And my husband and I were sitting over here at this table. And we were talking about a divorce and separating. And she said, watching the love act between the two of you, we went home and renewed our commitment to our marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did marital counseling sitting in a bar eating a hamburger, making eyes at my wife. I want to tell you this stuff is good. I've done better ministry in the bar than I do in my counseling. Matter of fact, you come to me for counseling, you probably will get the divorce. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not a counselor. So I started hearing the voice of God. Not only did he go to the bar, I heard the voice of God in Matthew, the 25th chapter. That's what Matthew, the 25th is built around, or M25 is built around. You, how many of y'all want to go to heaven? It said, if you want to go to heaven. Now, I'm not smart. Look at me. Look at me. Say this with me. He's not smart. I'm not smart. I, I went through Southwestern Bible College. Took me the longest four hours to get from that front door to the back door of any time in my life. I have no degrees. I am a, I'm not very smart. So when I read that and it said, if you don't feed the hungry, you go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, Sister Edith. I don't want to go to hell. 
And I said, God, you show me how, and I'll go like you went, and I'll feed like you fed. You just show me how. You show me the opportunity. And when I was sitting underneath that bridge on a Sunday morning before I went over to preach, remember, I've got a church full of people waiting on me. And I'm underneath a bridge, and I said, God, I'm not going to do anything, but I'm going to feed people donuts. I'm going to give them coffee, and I'm going to give them love. And if they ask me, I'm going to pray for them. Because, see, M25 believes that you don't have the right to walk up to a man on the streets and ask him if you can pray for him. Jesus never done that. He waited for them to ask him. And so I said, God, we're going to wait till you put it in their heart to ask us for prayer. And so that's what we did underneath the bridge. We just loved them. I said, I'll never give them anything. I'm sitting underneath the bridge. It's 37 degrees, spitting snow. I'm on a motorcycle. I'm sit down on a curb beside this guy. Yeah, I know his street name because I've been underneath there a while. His name was Moses. He had long gray hair. His beard was down to here, and it was matted with vomit from the night he threw up before. He had urinated all over himself. It's 37 degrees. He's shaking all over. I sat down beside him. I said, sir, can I get you a cup of coffee? He said, I need something. I got up. I got him that cup of coffee. I sat back down beside him. And I said, I, 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 how many of you know the Holy Spirit put words in your mouth? Amen. How many of you know it's not fun every time? Amen. I'm sitting there and all of a sudden out of my mouth roll these words. I'm going to give you my gloves. And I may need my gloves. It's 37 degrees, dude. It's cold out there and I'm riding a motorcycle. He said, I can't take your gloves. And I'll be doggone if the Holy Spirit didn't say out of my mouth, you can't have them for free. Now, man, what would a guy living in a cardboard box that spent his last dime on have that I want? I said, <laughs> every that words rolled out of my mouth, and I went, God, <laughs> really? Well, what, what I want? And he looked at me, and he said, really? What? And I'm going, I don't know. Holy Spirit, page two. <laughs> I don't know. And all of a sudden rolled out of my, off of my lips. I want you to pray for me. I said those words, and Pastor Steve, I could feel J.E. Madewell flipping in the grave. I thought, oh my God, what have I just done? I've asked a man that's a drunk to pray for me. That man raised one hand in the sky. I'm trying to cut it a little short, but he raised one hand up in the sky and he put the other one on my shoulder. And he says, God, you know who I am, and you know where I'm at. And this man of God has asked me to pray for him. I can't tell you another thing that man said. God took a hammer. It was no longer about church business. It was about broken people. God sledged, hammered my heart. And I sat there and wept because I knew that religion had controlled me all of my life. And the voice of God spoke. I learned that I, from that day forward, I believe that I know things that people with five doctorates will not know because I've sat with Jesus in a ditch and I've heard him talk to me. Are you hearing me this morning? Can I tell you, can I tell you that Moses was a, was a Texas ranger? Can I tell you that his wife found another man and his partner found a bullet and he found a bottle and for 11 years he was estranged from his family? Can I tell you I got him back with his family? Can I tell you I got to baptize him in water? Can I tell you he's still sober today and still calls me and tells me thank Oh, come on church, give Jesus a hand. I learned to listen to the voice of the broken. I learned to hear the voice of God through the broken. But there's something else I've got to tell you about this thing. This voice that you're going to hear. But the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm just trying to follow his lead. Is this, am, am, am I okay? I know I'm supposed to preach twice today, but... <laughs> It's hard to come in and just give you a, a nursery rhyme. You know what I'm saying? 
That stuff is big in me. So it's cost me everything. The voice of God is costly. There's a whole voice out there. You know, when I teach men, I'm going to teach this weekend. I'll probably teach for about seven hours, and then I'll preach two services this next weekend. Friday and Saturday, Saturday night and Sunday morning. And when I'm going to, I'll start it off with what kind of man is it that doesn't leave the world in a better place? Huh? How many of you know we can't call it success if our world is in a mess? Huh? I don't care how big our church is here. I don't care how many people speak in tongues. If we leave this country in the mess it's in right now, my grandchildren is in for a rude rude awakening in a terrible world, and that drives my boat. Are y'all with me this morning? That's the problem. That's the problem. I said, God, my grandson was telling Pastor Steve last night, He's a, he's a jock. I mean, he's, I have seven grandchildren, but he is the athlete of the bunch. 180 kids went out for football in eighth grade, and he was the first one picked to be the first string quarterback. He's a stud. And what, what happened was, was I, went, I took him, just he and I went camping. And I, says, I said, Brax, how's things doing? He said, Papa, it's nervous. And I said, what do you mean, what's nervous? He said, it just makes me nervous. And I said, what makes you nervous? He said, because I, I couldn't see that boy afraid of anything. I know his roots. And I said, what, what are you afraid of? And he said, Papa, she changes clothes in my locker room. I said, what? He says, there's this girl that had her name changed to be a boy. And now she's in my locker room changing clothes. Does that shake you up? I called the athletic director, and I said, what, what is going on? And he says, he said to me, he says, Gary, I would be disappointed if you hadn't have called me. I helped him get his first job. And I was going, God, how can we continue and not fight the battles out there? Are you all following me? If it costs us everything. Jesus said, you know, today, what we do is we say, you want to get saved today? Jesus is here. He's going to give you fire insurance, and he's going to bless you with this, and he's going to bless you with that, and he's going to bless you with this, and it's all about this, and it's about that. Come on, help me. Am I trite? When I was saved, it was, are you ready to lose it all? Are you ready to give it all? Because, see, Jesus, when people came to him, he said, listen, are you willing to be homeless? Birds have nests, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Come on, help me. Is that truth? One guy comes to him and says, I want to be a part of your kingdom. He says, just go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then come back and we'll talk about you being a part of the kingdom. How many of you believe that is church growth in action? Huh? Am I okay? All right, you told me I could be blunt. Yeah, I'm blunt. I don't even know any other way to be. But when you leave here, you're going to know what I believe, whether you agree with it or not. Come on. That's why I like being with Steve. He told me he's the same way. So I said, okay, God, we're going to follow you. Thank God I have a wife. That understands that. And she's just as crazy as I am. I've ridden 665,000 miles on my motorcycle doing this stuff. And she's got logged probably over 250,000 of those. And I've watched her sit on the back of that bike when it was snowing. And she stayed the course with me. I've been on it with her when it was 115. And she stayed the course with me. And I'm thankful that God paired us up together. Because we're both crazy. You can say that. Say he's crazy. But I learned something. Somebody is going to have to start living Hebrews 11b. Huh? 11a, we talk about 
oh, God did this and God did that and God performed this miracle and God performed that miracle. And you get down to 11B and it says, and then there were those. Come on, come on. Then there were those. And the reason I love doing this part of it is because I, I've got young men around me right now that have forsaken everything in South Carolina, a beautiful church, a beautiful plan, a beautiful everything, and they're living on a reservation in the Native Americans in Montana right now. I have a man that left another church in South Carolina. He's down in Arlington with us. I'm telling you, God is raising up some radicals around this country, and that's what I'm looking for is radicals that are really ready to make a difference in our country. And I never know but what there's going to be one sitting in a crowd that's not afraid to live, Hebrews 11b. You know, we're talking about run for the wall. It took 51 people across countries. Would three of y'all smile at me? Maybe I'm too blunt. Hebrews 11b. We've took 51 people, paid for all of their lodging, all of their gas, all of their food, their entry fee, everything across this nation. Cost us last year. I hadn't done the numbers yet this year. But last year cost us $62,000 to accomplish that. And people say, wow, man, what a difference. This is so cool. See, we believe that the voice of God is costly and risky. My wife and I moved out of our three-bedroom, three-bath, two-story home I built out on the acreage and moved into a home behind the church that had a bullet hole from a drive-by shooting. Yeah. I remember calling her. I'm on the road. Hey, honey, how's it going? Oh, Gary. I said, what's up? Oh, Gary, let me show you. She raised the window curtain up and points the camera out there. How many of y'all like FaceTime? Then she points the camera out there, and they've got a, two young men handcuffed in my front yard. I've watched them shoot. I've watched a policeman shoot a young man in my front yard. I'm telling you, we, lived, we, we knew it was risky. We knew that there was a cost to this thing. And then... When we started running for the wall, I knew I heard from God. Because, see, there was a three-war veteran came up to me at a VA hospital, and he says to me, he says, Gary, I fought in three. Well, he didn't call me Gary. He looked at me, he said, aren't you a Christian? And I said, well, I give it my darndest. And he said, well, I'm telling you, I don't understand it. And I said, what's that? And he said, I fought in three wars. He said, the bars shut down, the schools turn out, the businesses shut down. I mean, they come, they come out on the streets. Everybody comes out to thank us veterans for the freedoms they have, but I've not seen the church once. He said, didn't I fight for the freedom of religion? I said, you fought for the freedom of religion, and I'm telling you right now, I'm going to make it a mission of my life to change that picture. And this year, we were encapsulated a thing, and God got the glory because we are letting them know that the church cares, that we're thankful. Church couldn't get the vision for that. So I looked at my wife and I said, honey, you know what that means, don't you? And she said, what? And I said, that means credit card. See, there's, there's this, I'd sit in those meetings, Steve, and they would say, or Pastor Steve, they would, they would sit in those meetings and they say, God's vision always is followed by God's provision. <laughs> Julie, I just sat there and keep my mouth shut because I'm a nice boy. And I was wanting to stand up and say, you don't get it. God's vision is funded with his provision inside the system. I'm blunt. And God is not changing the world with our system. And so I told her, I said, we're, we're looking at some bad days. But we don't owe for a house. We don't owe for a car. And people go in debt for houses and cars, we're going to go in debt for ministry. And at one time, we were $83,000 in credit card debt, unsecured debt, doing run for the wall. Don't worry. He's already given me my check. I'm not raising money. I'm just telling you that sometimes 11B, they wandered in the desert. They were in despair. They were work sheepskins and goatskins for clothing. They didn't have what they needed. How many of y'all know the church needs to raise that up back into the kingdom? Come on, help me. 
Am I telling the truth? The church, Bob Ely messed me up when I was 15 years old. It's his fault. Y'all hit him after the service. Don't hit me. He's the one who taught me to give it all to the Lord. Him and my mom and my dad and Dwight Burchett and Damon Burroughs, those men taught me to hear the voice of God and then do whatever it took to do what God has asked me to do. And Bob, I've never regretted one moment of it. My wife and I said, we do not have one penny of retirement left. We cashed it all in, all of our debts paid. But say, somebody say, thank God. All of our debts paid, but we cost us everything that we have. And my wife and I looked at each other yesterday, just this past, we were only together three days. And she looked at me one day and she said, I'd do it all over again. How about you? And I said, I'd do it all over again. How many of y'all hear what I'm saying this morning when you hear the voice of God? This thing keeps coming to my head, so I'm going to have to share it. I, I write notes. Uh, they're on my lap. Uh, they're on my iPad. I'll send them to you. <laughs> But when the Holy Spirit just keeps hammering me, I, I, I got to do it. You know what I'm saying? How many of y'all remember the Christmas? How many of y'all old enough? Danny, you're old enough. How many of you remember the Christmas plays back in the day? Huh? They, they put a bathrobe on you? And they tied a towel around your head? Y'all remember that? And they made you a shepherd. And you walked out and went, cheap, cheap, cheap. Y'all remember that? <laughs> and if you could, you know, we had a plastic baby up in the, the little piece of wood with some little hay on it. Y'all remember those days? And, and we had that little plastic because if we put a real baby in there, you'd have to change the diaper halfway through the program, mess the program up. You remember that? So they put a plastic doll up there. And so then if you could really project your voice, you, you could be meaner than a junkyard dog. You're looking at him. Uh, but I could project my voice. And this guy gets up. And, and, and if you were that guy, they would put a nicer robe on you. I mean, a white sheet on you. I forgot about the three wise men. That's where the nicer robes came. But then the, they put a white sheet on you. They cut a hole in the top of it. Y'all remember that? Drape the white sheet over you. And then they would take this little thing and make it out of baling wire. And they would make this halo and cover it with tin foil. Y'all remember that? And you, when you walked, it went burn, burn, burn. Y'all remember that? And if you could project, you got to step out on the side of the stage and say, peace on earth, good will toward man. Y'all remember that? <laughs> Something that God, I, I was going to bring it in today, but I've not been able to preach anywhere that I hadn't brought this up. We told half the story. That's half the story, Bob. The rest of the story is, if we're going to tell the Christmas story right, we would have to take about 75 babies and cut their heads off, little baby dolls like we had in the manger, cut their heads off, put a white pajama on them, and put ketchup down here to cover make up like his blood. And we would have to cover the whole front of the church with dead baby bodies. See, the reason we're not willing to risk is because we've not been told the whole truth. I don't fear the one who can take my body. I fear the one who can damn my soul. Huh? And I'm going to do what he said, no matter what it costs me. And once the church hears, gets to that point where they can hear that voice, things can start changing in this country. I'm going to close with this. There's something about, and just, just making sure the Holy Spirit's through with me there, because it's not all bad. It's good. I used to have an old hot tub. You had to make sure that you had the right clothes on and set in it just right because it had cracks in it. How many of you ever sit in one of those things that had cracks in it, pinch you on your way out? <laughs> so I, I had this old hot tub, and I would sit in that hot tub sometimes for five hours. Just, I mean, I'd come out looking like a pickle, you know? And I'd, but I, the Lord would just speak to me in that hot tub. And I was sitting in the hot tub one day, 
and the Holy Spirit was there. I mean, he's, of course, he's always there, but he started talking to me, the voice, the voice. And he says to me, Bobby, it was one of the most profound times in my life. And when I tell it, I, I, I wrote it in my notes to tell it this morning. And I said, God, are you sure it'll be understood? Because this is not arrogant speaking. This is not me being arrogant. I remember sitting there in that hot tub on the wrong side of town, broken for people. It was about probably six or seven years ago. And the Holy Spirit said, Gary, I no longer call you a servant. I call you my friend. I went, whoa. I knew it was the Holy Spirit. I knew he was talking to me. And I said, Holy Spirit, I can't remember where it's at. And I'd already destroyed an iPad and an iPhone by carrying them into the hot tub with me. So I didn't have anything in there with me. And I said, Holy Spirit, I got to get out. I got to go find that in the Word. I know what's in there, but I can't remember right now where it's at. And I got so excited about the Word. And God said, just sit there. Holy Spirit said, just sit here. Relax. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes. And I can't explain to you what happened that day. But I'm going to tell you that I found an intimacy that I had not known with my master. And I felt him starting to talk to me like I had prayed in 1986 at 5 o'clock in the morning. God, tell me the secret things. Tell me the things that nobody else is hearing. I want to know what you've got to say. And God began to just pour into me. And I got out and I read it. How many of you know what John 15 14, 15 says. He says, you've done what I've told you to do. So now, I no longer call you a servant or a slave. I call you a friend because you've done what I've told you to do. Julie, I'm going to tell you, I get angry a lot of times in church because I see them sing that song, I am a friend of God. And I watch you know people that don't know what it is to obey God sing that song and claim to be his friend and I want to get up and say you don't have a clue you've not obeyed him see the key to this thing is our obedience if we used 5% 2% of everything that this man and this woman has poured into you all of these years if you use 5% of it we could change this city and we just got to be obedient so I don't know what, and I'm sure Stacy Hilliard is a heck of a preacher. I mean, in y'all's world, he's really a great preacher. He's a great guy. And I'm sure he's going to come and he's going to have a word from God that will lift you up. He chose, he made this mess that I'm doing, and he chose to have me come and do it. So y'all take it up with them. I want everybody to shake my hand and say, hi, Gary, when we leave here. Point is, <laughs> how do I end this? I got up at four thirty, left my room at four forty. I worked a wreck of seven motorcycles, bodies laying everywhere, out on room for the law. I got on my bike took care of them, loved on them, did my text messages and my phone calls. And I rode till 1130 that night to get to my next stop. And I was listening to worship music. And one of them was, this, Lord, you've done so much for me. How could I ever tell you no? How many of y'all believe that God's done a lot for you? Huh? Pastor Steve set the stage for that. forgiven me of so much anybody else in this house and there's nothing he could ask of me that I wouldn't be willing to do my wife prayed over our meal yesterday she said God you've done so much for us 
we could never tell you no. I don't know of anything you could ask of us we wouldn't do. Church, I, I believe that the earth people inside this church, inside the church world that God's wanting to talk to and give you directions. Would you stand with me? I'm not, I want to close my eyes because I don't want you to patronize me. I want to pray over you. And if you want the Holy Spirit to speak to you, I want you just to hold your hand out like a cup. You can say, Lord, but Pastor Steve a while ago said, if there's been a time in your life you were closer, say, God, I want to be closer. Maybe there's some in this building. I believe with all my heart that the channels are cut when God gives us something and we don't obey. He didn't give us another command until we obey the one that he gave us. At least that's been my experience. So maybe you're one of those that just, God needs to renew that voice. I want you to just hold that hand out there and I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to speak his word to you. And then once that you start being obedient, somewhere down the road, he can tap you on the shoulder and say, look, I'm not going to talk to you like a servant anymore. I'm going to start talking to you like my friend. And he can share those intimate things with you. Father, I'm not sure what was expected of me today. But I know that I felt what you expected of me. And Lord, I have shared and I pray, God, that you would motivate, facilitate, activate, and as Pastor Steve prayed well ago, position these believers to be you to a world. Thank you for that prayer, Lord, that helped me bounce off of it. Because, God, there is a world out there that needs you. And, Lord, we need to serve them so they can know we love them so that we can share truth with them. And so, Lord, as we go from this day, teach us, show us opportunity. Lord, whatever you do, position us with some Moseses to break our heart. Break through the crust and get us to the place where we can be used in your hand, no matter what it costs, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for letting me be here today. You may be seated. I think he's coming. I do want to... I, I don't want you to sit down. Stand back up for just a second. expect God to move in every series we do. I don't want to diminish that, but I sincerely believe that there are moments in this series where we need to take time. We don't get, it's summer, we don't get to do this like this all the time, but I, I really sense that God has challenged. One thing my dad has taught me is that when you challenge people, you have to give a chance for them to respond. You have to. Otherwise, we go home and usually in disobedience <laughs> and we forget. I just really sense, I know there's another service starting and so we're going to we're gonna do this different this morning. Um, Lauren, if you'll help me, you can have the offering bucket at the door and if you want to give this morning, which I hope you will, you can just give as you exit this morning. Um, I'll say this without trying to quench the Holy Spirit at all, but because my heart is pure in this. If you're visiting with us for the first time, if you'd fill out your little communication card, you can drop that in the offering bucket just because we want to stay in touch with you. But I really sense that God's calling us to prayer. Um, 
delayed obedience is still disobedience. Um, there is only one thing that that equals obedience, and that's obedience. And I just really sense that the Holy Spirit is calling us and challenging us about our obedience level. And so what I'm going to ask you this morning is a couple of questions that the Holy Spirit was asking me. I'll ask you. One is, what has he told you to do that you're still not doing? What? We talked to you. Ding, ding, ding. I spoke about obedience last week. Go back and listen. What has he told you to do that you're not doing? Whether it's your lifestyle, whether it's ministry, whatever it is. What has he said to you that you're not doing? Because if you're not doing it or if you're putting it off or I'll get to it, then that's disobedience. And Pastor Gary said it right. At that moment, it all falls apart. You're cut off. So I just really sense that what we need to do this morning is spend some time in prayer submitting to what he's told us to do. We cannot move forward. Listen to me. I'm going to get to speak to you in four, five more weeks. We cannot move forward to next, corporately or individually. Some of you, I know some of y'all. I know most of you. And I know the cry of your hearts, what's next? For you personally. Those of you that are uh, in, looking for relationship, you're like, who's next? New job, what's next? New role, what's next? What's next? As a church, we're praying about what's next. Y'all don't know this. He doesn't know this. I met with the finance team three weeks ago and said, I think this is what's next. I don't know how we're going to get there because we don't have the money for it. But what I've discovered is you don't have the money for it until you deal with what he said to do now. So that works individually. It works corporately. I think God's got a lot of nexts for us, but we can't get there. And I keep questioning, why do we keep pounding up against this wall? We get to this point and back up. We get to this point and back up. Maybe it's because we're not obeying what he's already told us to do. And what I want to tell you is that individually, your lack of obedience individually has implications for us corporately. We all got to be in this together. So I'm just going to challenge you this morning as Seth continues to play. April, if you'll help me, a couple of them will come into place. And at some point, we'll go into worship. And if new folks walk in, great. They can come do what I'm going to ask you to do. I want to ask you to find a place to pray. And this is your dismissal. I want you to pray because we're famous at two-minute prayers. I want you to stay in prayer until you surrender. Surrender to what? Whatever he says. You're living in sin? Get out of it. You were supposed to give something you haven't given it? Give it. If you were supposed to mend a relationship, mend it. If you were supposed to go do something, do it. But whatever, stay in prayer until you can stand up and have the ability to leave knowing that you will obey. That's pretty open-ended, isn't it? Because some of you will come to that point like this, but for some of us that are a little more stubborn, it takes a little bit. I'll testify. It takes a little bit for me. And so this morning, if that's you, I'm not going to ask if that's you because I think that's us. I don't know where we're going from here. They'll start singing at some point. I don't even know if you'll get to preach again, Pastor Gary. Who cares? I don't care. But I want you to find a place and pray until you submit. We used to call that tarry. We don't use that term anymore. I want you to wait until you submit. And at the moment that you come to the place of surrender and submission, then you're free to go. So would you find a place to pray this morning?